Actually, just the ring. Well, thank you everybody for joining us live here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge. We're honored to have you with us. We're very grateful. Uh, even a few of us, a few people made it. We have a group from New Hampshire here, a group from New York, somebody from Brooklyn as well, or Albany area. So we got a few people to get through the weather and praise be to God that you are here for the first Saturday talk. We're gonna continue with Marian apparitions. And as you saw on the slide, these are a few I'm gonna to cover today that are the lesser known Marian apparitions but yet they're very important. So I've always said, I'm excited to go back to seminary. That was my funnest time of my life. And I wanted to say, you know what, if I could do anything, I want to go back to seminary, taking you with us. And we're going to talk about a couple really powerful apparitions today. Let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit down upon us to open our minds and hearts to receive the grace you wish to bestow, the grace to lead us to eternal life, and that grace that will be given also through the hands of our Blessed Mother. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so welcome everybody. We're going to have you turn down your cell phones, but you can join us if you're here at the shrine. We've got a nice group of people in the back here as well. Can You can join us on our YouTube channel, which is called Divine Mercy, or our Facebook page, which is Divine Mercy Official. And you can watch the slides I'm going to be showing, and we're going to show a couple short video clips that go with the talks we're talking about today. Now, if you have ever, well, put it this way, I think every Catholic at one time or another has heard of Our Lady of Guadalupe. But do you know that there are some that are so similar to it that are from that area, but nobody's ever heard of them? Let's look at our next slide, if Brother can Mark can put up. And this is, we're going to start today with Our Lady of Cromato. You're like, what? <laughs> She's the patroness of Venezuela. We really need this today if you understand what's going on in Venezuela. If anybody thinks that the type of government that you have or the changes that are going on in our leaderships and governments don't matter, look what is going on in Venezuela. We need to pray to Our Lady and this patroness. Here's an important story. All right. We know that we have the miraculous image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, but the question is, has Our Lady left us another miraculous image of herself besides Guadalupe in the same South America area? All right, it's tiny. This is the tiniest of all the images Our Lady left. You know, we think of the images she did with the big tilma or the statues. This image is this big. The image that Our Lady left, it's tiny, but it's powerful. And the symbols are, have been verified at that time in the culture of the 17th century Venezuela. It's been totally authenticated. What happened? All right. In 1591, the Portuguese began to come into the area of Venezuela, and the Indian tribe that was there in the area uh, fled north into the jungle there in Venezuela. Now... A Venezuelan chief, the tribe chief, was chosen by Mary to evangelize the Cromato Indians, but you've never even heard of them. And it ended up with him being a modern-day Jonah, or actually another Juan Diego. And this is somebody we've never heard of. And we really need to understand this today to help these people in Venezuela right now. So basically, he, he desperately tried to escape from this mission, just like Juan Diego did, just like Jonah did. They tried to say, no, Lord, you can't use me. But ultimately, he fulfilled it. What happened? All right. She appeared to the ruler of the Cromato Indians and his wife in 1651. So now this is a couple decades after the Portuguese had moved in. They were living in the forest. They had fled. And she told him in his own language, go to the white men and ask them to pour water onto your head so that you can go to heaven. 
Wow, if you ever want confirmation of baptism, huh? Pour water onto your head. They have them do it, the priests, so that you can go to heaven. I mean, why wouldn't we want to do this? Why would we not want our children baptized? This is the important message here. So the virgin asked him and his whole tribe to be baptized. But just like so many people today, so many of us, the chief started to learn about the Catholic faith, started looking into it, and some of his other members did too. But then he started to worry about what it would be looking like, his image, his reputation. Sound familiar? How many people in Hollywood today are afraid, afraid to even mention they're Christian? So they skip the sacraments, they give up their, the church. And so basically he was worried about whether converting would affect his leadership role. All right, so he stopped short, he quit. He didn't get baptized and he encouraged other of his Indians not to get baptized either. Now, some still did, right? But many followed him. This is the power of a leader. And this is why it's important if you're a leader to lead the people the right way. All right? So Our Lady then appeared to him again on her birthday, September 8th, 1652. But, and she came to him in his own hut. First time was in the forest. Second time was in the hut. And again, he ignored her. All right, so now, the Blessed Mother, though, she's not to be deterred. Even though she was met with deaf ears, she disappeared and she left in the chief's hand a teeny tiny little image, this big. Let's take a look. Brother Mark is going to show up on the screen. That's the image. You can actually get it on a medal. Isn't that one of the most beautiful medals you've ever seen? It's gorgeous. I'm going to try to get one of those myself. That's an amazing, a beautiful medal. And she left this image of herself holding the child Jesus in her lap. Now, he still didn't follow her direction. We're stubborn sometimes. But he never forgot that she said, have that water poured on your head so you could go to heaven. He never forgot that. So anyway, a little bit later, they were going through the forest and he was bitten by a poisonous snake. And the snake dug his fangs and punctured into the skin. It was a very venomous snake and his companions knew that he was going to die. He only had hours to live. Once you get to that point with these venomous snakes, that's it. And so it seemed death was imminent. So remembering Mary's promise that if he got baptized, he would go to heaven, he started urgently asking to get baptized. This is sometimes why God allows us, right, to go through trial and tribulation, because only when we get shook up do we sometimes respond. So anyway, the news of this apparition, this beautiful lady who had appeared, started to spread. And so he got baptized and got better. And so he cured. He would live through this, and people were shocked. You know, the natives know these snakes, and they're like, whoa, something's going on here. So anyway, the devotion grew. The rest of the Cromato Indians were baptized after the chief himself got baptized and embraced the faith. So then a church was built in honor of Our Lady of Cromato in the nearby town there in the 1700s. Now, let's go to our next slide. Brother Mark's going to show. Isn't that a beautiful shrine? Now, later in the 1980s, a shrine was built at this exact location of the 1652 apparition. I mean, if you ever get a chance to go to some of these places, it's almost surreal that you could be standing in the same place. So both churches have been elevated to be basilicas. And there's a large statue of Our Lady Cromato, as well as the original relic, the little tiny uh, image of her, is in that shrine. So if you ever get to go there. Now, the relic the Blessed Virgin left with the chief is very authentic. 
All right, the image was analyzed, just like Our Lady of Guadalupe's image on the tilma, the cactus and all the miracles that the, that the image is not actually seeped into the fibers but rest, hovers above it. The cactus fiber should have disintegrated in 50 years, but it's, it's, it's almost 500 years old. This image is similar. All right, the relic that was left, the image was thoroughly analyzed. And basically, the Indian symbols that were found in the image, let's look at Brother Mark, put it on your screen. That's the actual image that you can see on your screen right now. I don't know if the people here have their phones, but if not, this video will remain online. And so basically, um, they were founded that the symbols in this image were authentic. The style of the crowns that Jesus and Mary had are authentic to the culture and time period of those people in the 17th century, all right? How the image itself was created, though just like Guadalupe, is a complete mystery. It's believed to be miraculous because the picture doesn't actually absorb any ink. It actually hovers microns above it. This is amazing. So while it, it, the picture appears to be drawn when you look at it, the paper that it's on does not absorb the ink. You can't explain this. So Our Lady of Cremato was declared patroness of Venezuela by Pius XII in 1949. And she is remembered, get this, She's remembered on three big days of the year. You can't get three bigger days for memories, right? September 8th, that's Our Lady's birthday. February 2nd, which is the presentation. And also, surprisingly, September 11th. Even before the attacks in New York, they were honoring her on September 11th. So let us turn to Our Lady. Let's watch a quick video now of this uh, apparition. Uh, it's not long. Let's take a look. And this tells you a little bit of Our Lady of Cremato. Imagine seeing the Blessed Virgin Mary and attacking her. With the arrival of the Spaniards in Venezuela in 1591, the Coromoto Indians left their village in fear. Then in 1651, the chief of the Coromoto Indians and his wife experienced an incredible vision while at the river. Floating above the water was a beautiful young woman with an equally beautiful child in her arms. In a gentle voice, she said to them, leave the forest with your people and go to the white men in order to receive the water on your heads so you will be able to enter heaven. Impressed, the chief brought his people into the Spanish village and they were taught the Catholic religion. But the chief and his people didn't like the new way of life and soon returned to their village. Once again, the lady appeared, this time in the chief's hut. But the chief attempted to throw her out and threatened to use weapons on her. He even attempted to grab hold of her, but as he reached out, she vanished. Suddenly, a card appeared in his hand, depicting Our Lady and the baby Jesus. From that point on, the chief and his people were at once converted to the Catholic faith. On October 7, 1944, Pope Pius XII declared Our Lady of Coromoto patroness of Venezuela. All right, so please pray for Venezuela, Our Lady of Cremato, pray for us and those people. Next, let's look at an incredible one that touches my heart closely, and that is, if Brother Mark could show the thing, Our Lady of Lavang. This is the patroness of Vietnam. And this story is incredible, and I learned about her when I went to seminary, and I'm taking you back to seminary with me, because I went to seminary with a whole group of Vietnamese nuns from the Our Ladies, uh, or um, Our La uh, Lovers of the Holy Cross. And so they're from Tang Hoa in the north and from Saigon in the south. Amazing nuns. And we're going to tell you this story right now. Our Lady of Levang. Okay, it goes back to 1798. Now, this shrine, Our Lady of Levang, is considered Vietnam's national shrine. Now, it's only locally approved, which means we can follow it. It's not formally approved fully because it hasn't, has, hasn't had the full process done yet, but it is locally approved, and so we wanted to talk about it today. Now, the Holy Father, when he went there, encouraged devotion to Our Lady of Levang in Vietnam. Now, the shrine 
is very complex, um, and it's, it's in central Vietnam in an area that's not yet fully developed. And it's located in what's called Cai Lavang, which is uh, the forest, which means trees of Lavang. Now, it's in the Archdiocese of Hue, spelled H-U-E. Now, some of you veterans out there might recognize that name. It was the bloodiest battle in Marine Corps history, uh, or in Vietnam, I should say. The bloodiest battle of Vietnam for the Marine Corps. It was an urban battle. Uh, my dad, who was over in Southeast Asia, was not at Way. Uh, he was more in Da Nang, but he talks about it and, and how many brave men lost their lives. And I think this is why Our Lady appeared there to give hope of what was future to come in, 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 in communism and these battles. And the Battle of Way, spelled H-U-E, was the bloodiest battle of Vietnam. People don't know that. And so this is where it is. It's in that archdiocese. Now, what happened? Late in the 18th century, remember that means 1700s, not 1800s, 18th century is 1798. They had an edict by the emperor, and the emperor basically banned Catholicism. And all of a sudden, that began a period of persecutions, and Catholics fled to the forest, just like Cremato. Because they were being persecuted, they fled. They fled into the forest, and many became ill. So this is Vietnam, 1798. So while hiding in the jungle, the people would gather every night at the foot of a large tree to pray the rosary. Can you imagine? These people are living in the jungle, escaping persecution. All they had to do was denounce their faith, and they wouldn't have to go through that. Talk about an example and, and we're worried about people uh, calling us uh, names because we're Catholic today. These people were willing to live in the forest. Many were getting sick. And so they would gather every night at a tree to pray the rosary. Now let's take a look at our next slide. All right. Then one night, an apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary, she came dressed in traditional Vietnamese clothes, holding like she usually does, Jesus, infant Jesus in her arms, and she had two angels with her. Two angels, and they appeared to him uh, or to them in the branches of a tree. Very similar, Fatima, others, right? So Mary assured them that the persecution would end, and she showed them an herb, a little leaf, to treat their diseases called Lavang. And so basically, she comforted them and told them to boil these leaves from the trees for medicine to cure their ills, these lavang. And so the name is from the type of fern. When you hear lavang, people think that's a city. It actually was originally the fern which used to grow a lot in that region and which cured the people. So now, this was 1798. Now, in a few years later, 1802, so four years later, the Christians were able to return partially to their villages. And this story of the apparition of Our Lady started to spread. So as it did, many people went to pray at that site. By 1820, a chapel was built. God bless the Vietnamese uh, Christians. Next to China, I think they're the bravest people in the world. They could easily, I mean, easily give up their faith just not to be persecuted. Yet so many of them are hanging in there. All right, from 1820 to 1885, then there was another wave of persecution that decimated these Christian Catholics. And so with more, um, more Vietnamese Christians now being martyred. Now, you may remember, if you're with us during the year and you go to daily mass, you might recognize that we have a feast on November 24th called the Vietnamese Martyrs. We honor 117 martyrs of Vietnam that were killed for their faith. That's from this. This is what the story is from. So basically, this was going on in the mid-1800s. Now, in 1885 then, the chapel in, Ardy of, in honor of Our Lady of Lavang was then destroyed by some fanatics. Sound similar to today? Yeah. So then a new chapel, God bless the perseverance of these Vietnamese Catholics. And so a new chapel was built in 1886 and then 1901. And soon it, they outgrew it. Too many people were coming. 
All right, so the pilgrims would come to Levang, and in 1923, a new and even bigger church was erected. Isn't God bless them? And so John the 23rd made it a basilica in 1961. But if any of you know what happened later in the 60s, my dad was one of them. The Battle of Vietnam, the war in Vietnam of Communist North and the South Democratic South trying to hold on to their freedom. So this war of what the North tried to reunify the South and bring them all under communist rule broke out in Vietnam. And the communists were, were trying to assume the South back in. So they left the shrine to basically ruin. So the shrine is basically neglected. Uh, the communist authorities, they basically wanted to stop all devotion and any restoration efforts. So here are these poor people. They've been tremendously persecuted. They finally have a home in the shrine. Now communism moves in and basically lets it fall into disrepair. Well, we got through the Vietnam War. Yes, there were some uh, losses there. The U.S. pulled out communism in a degree to take over, but they couldn't stomp out Catholicism. Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. So in 1998, John Paul II, on the 200th anniversary, because remember this was 1798, so in 1998, John Paul II said the sanctuary should be rebuilt. Now, to date, behind the remains of the old sanctuary from the 1800s, a new sanctuary is being built. It's gigantic. It's a sacred building that they say will be on par with the Marian shrines of Lourdes, Fatima, and Chestahova, and even one I talked about a couple weeks ago in India, Valankani. This again shows the perseverance of the Vietnamese people. In the chapel, there is, or excuse me, at the shrine, they have chapels. They have a way of the cross with a giant dedication to the 117 Vietnamese martyrs. And on it is the slogan, I am ready to fight and die for my homeland, but do not ask me to renounce my Catholic faith. These are the minority in Vietnam. They're just a few percentage of the population. Now, let's look at, Brother Mark's going to show the next slide. There's a statue of the virgin and the child dressed in traditional Vietnamese clothes now stands at the concrete as a concrete sculpture in the form of a group of trees, right? And so you can see this. It's really, really powerful. And I don't know if I skipped a slide or not, but the next one I want to show is the nuns. So if Brother Mark can show, these are the nuns that I went to seminary with. This is just some of them. Aren't they awesome? These are the, the most awesome little Vietnamese nuns. Always had a smile, always were laughing, always full of joy. They're from the lovers of the Holy Cross. I went to seminary with them. Part of the reason I loved seminary was just the joy. They would always laugh. They would always be upbeat. And in the midst of their families being persecuted, they never lost faith, hope, joy. Amazing example. I just love the, those, those, those nuns. And so anyway, the, the, the cult of Our Lady of Levang, and remember, cult doesn't mean demonic Cult means a devotion in the original language, cultus. The cultus of Our Lady of Levang is widespread now among Catholics. And not just Catholics. Check this out. Our Lady of Levang has spread in Vietnam to Buddhists and Protestants who pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary for special graces. Will she maybe be a key to bringing us together? Buddhists, Protestants, they're praying there to the Blessed Virgin Mary for special graces. What a great, great story. So this history of Levang is intertwined with the whole history of Vietnam and what happened when the French came in um, in Dien Bien Phu and then they, they got kicked out but they brought the Catholic faith. So all I, although that we said that the, they've not formally gone through the process of recognition, it's traditionally recognized, locally recognized, and truly important. Um, let's take a look at the next slide. Many parishes in the world have 
are named Our Lady of Lavang. And, and actually, if you go to Washington, D.C., where I was as a seminarian, you can go into the Basilica of the National, uh, the National Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. This is Washington, D.C., and they have a beautiful shrine to Our Lady of Lavang. There's a picture of it. There's a picture of it. This is right in Washington, D.C. And so I used to go there after I got to know the sisters, and I would pray, pray for the Vietnamese there. I encourage you to do the same. So basically, this is a powerful devotion. You know, in fact, in August, if we have any Missourians with us, in Carthage, Missouri, every year, up to 100,000 people gather for one of the largest pilgrims, pilgrimages in the United States. It's been happening since 1978. 1978 is a big year. John Paul was elected. The ban on divine mercy was lifted. Three popes served in the year 1978. And so they gather together for Our Lady of Lavang in one of the biggest pilgrimages in the United States ever of any kind. This is important stuff. And so they celebrate her on the Assumption. What day is the Assumption? August 15th. Up to 5 million people go to Mass in honor of Our Lady of Lavang. Although still you will be hear it denied in Vietnam, there's no real tourism of it, um, there's real uh, denial of it, it still thrives. Even though the communists try to squash it, you can't. You know, small little steps, right? Let's pray for them. All right, real quick, let's watch a quick video uh, on Our Lady of Lavang. 1785. Catholic persecution is underway. A community of Catholics flee to the rough mountainous jungles in central Vietnam to save themselves. They cling to their faith while suffering from illness, starvation, and more. They would often gather together and pray the rosary under a banyan tree. Then one day in 1789, a lady dressed in traditional Vietnamese garb, holding a small child, and accompanied by angels, appear in their midst. She offers words of love and encouragement to the persecuted faithful. She tells them to pick a certain plant to cure them of illness. The Catholics were greatly heartened by the message. Devotion to Our Lady of Lavang spread when persecution lessened. And devotion continued when persecution slurred up again in Vietnam, lasting through the late 1800s. Eventually, a shrine is built. And eventually, a church is consecrated in 1901 at the site of the apparition. All right, so pray for those in Vietnam. Now, our final and last apparition today is one, again, you've probably not heard of, Our Lady of Lehan. And as Brother Mark show it, it's spelled L-I-C-H-E-N. Yes, that's in Poland. And there's a very interesting tie here to the Marian Fathers. And so if you are a Marian helper, if you're not a Marian helper, please become one. It doesn't cost anything. It's, it takes but a second to sign up. It's a lot of grace. And we'll show you how to do it at the end of this talk. But if you're a Marian helper, you're connected to this. Our Lady of Lehand in Poland. That's the image that Brother Mark just showed. Now, the image of Our Lady of Lehand dates back to the second half of the 18th century. So you can see this is where we're doing our time frame. We've been walking you through these Marian apparitions and we'll continue going up to the modern day every first Saturday, so please join us. But anyway, it's not known who painted it, kind of like the traditions of anonymous writings. So the painting underwent several restorations, but Our Lady's face never changed. Like some of the attire or some of the crown or the veil changed, never her face. Her face never changed. It stood intact. Now, the shrine of Lehan is located in southwest Poland, and it is within traveling distance of Jasna Gora, which is Our Lady of Czestochowa. The Black Madonna, she has a little scar on her face. We'll talk about that one coming up. Not today. <laughs> and it's one of Poland's most important pilgrimage and apparition sites. And we Marians are tied to it. How? All right. The history of this is from, starts in 1813, when there was a big war that took place. There was a battle going on in Germany, and Polish soldiers were fighting under Napoleon, surprisingly. 
All right, so they were fighting under his armies, and Tomasz Klo, uh, Klosowski was seriously wounded. All right, and so if Brother Mark can go back to the first slide that we just showed, Our Lady of Lehan with the guy laying there wounded, you could see that's him. See, that, that, that's a Polish soldier laying on the ground. And, the, um, and he began to invoke Our Lady, begging her not to let him die in a foreign land. See him laying there? He's basically invoking her. He's in Germany. Don't let me die here. I'm Polish. <laughs> and so Mary appeared wearing a crown, a crown and a dress and a golden mantle. All right? And she was holding a white eagle. Now, does anybody know what white eagle is? That's a symbol of Poland the white eagle on the flag, all right? And so this matched the symbol of Poland, and she comforted that soldier and promised that he would recover and return to Poland. Now, she asked him, this is, this is the most unique request I've ever heard Mary ask. I mean, well, I guess Juan Diego would be. But she asked this soldier to go find a picture of her in the woods in Poland. That's all he was given, can you imagine? I mean, if somebody said, Father Chris, find me something in your office, my own office, I probably couldn't find it. It's a disaster. And here she is telling him to go back to Poland and look in the woods. <laughs> well, I want you to find a picture in my likeness and make it known throughout Poland. Poland is a chosen special people, I think, along with the Filipinos. And so this soldier healed and returned to his home, which was ironically near Lehi. Now, let's look at our next slide. He wandered about the countryside searching for this miraculous image. You can see it on your screen. That's the miraculous image that he was looking for. Now, guess what? In 1836, he finally found it in Legata. At first, he put it in his own house. All right? He put it in his own house, and then he hung it up on an old pine tree in a nearby forest, right? Pushka Grablinska, Grablinska. And so basically, he finds it. He spends his life looking for it. He finds it, and he takes it back into the forest. So as I'm studying this, that person, I'm like, well, why did he do that? And then it made sense. So in 1850 then, so what, 14 years later, the Blessed Virgin revealed herself to a shepherd. Sound familiar? Makalov Sikaka. Makalov Sikaka, who was basically pasturing his cattle near where the image was in the forest. And she gave a message. Our Lady summoned, listen to this. This is, this is the same message Our Lady gives everywhere. Fatima, at, uh, at Kibejo, at, at all these different places. She gives this message. Conversion. Turn back to our Lord. Stop offending him. Break with greed and licentiousness. Pray the rosary. Participate in mass. Don't give up practicing your faith. She asked priests to celebrate the liturgy worthily. Sadly, this was almost 200 years ago. Just think, what about today? Ooh. Finally, she requested that her image be moved to a more fitting place. A little better than sitting on a pine tree in the forest. And so she promised that those who would pray before it would escape the plague. Because the plague was still there. Kind of sound familiar to today? With corona, right? And furthermore, the Holy Virgin predicted the foundation of the sanctuary and the monastery in Lehan. Guess whose sanctuary that is? The Marian Fathers. The Marians of the Immaculate Conception. And she predicted the shrine. Guess who runs the shrine at Lehan? The Marians of the Immaculate Conception. It was entrusted to the Marian Fathers. Don't ask me why Mary keeps entrusting these things to us. We're just a ragtag group. We're not like the powerful Dominicans or Franciscans or the Jesuits. But God has brought you into our Marian family for a purpose. 
Maybe he wants you to be part of this ragtag army, just like the ragtag army that won the American Revolution, despite facing the biggest army in the world in Britain. And we're facing the biggest army in the world called secularism and, and cultural relativism. It's convinced it's going to bring down faith and, and, and worship in, the, in this world. No. And so basically, she wanted her glory to be made known there. Makalov then, the, the, this little shepherd, um, started to spread Our Lady's message, but he was persecuted and then imprisoned by the Russians. Again, sound familiar? This is the persecution we are facing all over the world as Christians, the Middle East, uh, especially all over the world. At first, people didn't believe this guy. But then two years later, Mary's prophecy came true. And a cholera epidemic broke out. And then they remembered this little shepherd warning them. What did Mary say at Fatima? If you don't convert and turn back to God, a great war will break out. Mary keeps giving us every single warning we could ever want. And we don't listen. And she keeps coming and doing this. So finally the people came, they flocked to this image, the holy image of Mary, and began to pray the rosary for the sick and dying. So this started to build. Then a special Episcopal, what does that mean, bishop, committee examined the apparition. And at the request of the parish priest, the committee decided to move the portrait to the parish church in Lehan. Okay, so it was out in the forest, now it gets moved into the church in Lehan. Now this took place in 1852, and it remained until 1939, as the war, World War II broke out. They have recorded over 3,000 prayers being answered. 3,000, this is more than Lord's. 3,000 answered prayers documented in healings. So during World War II, both the church and the rectory were confiscated and used by the Nazis. Fortunately, they hid the image. Miraculously, just like the image of divine mercy. It was hidden in Vilnius and saved from the Germans. So basically, the image was hidden from the communists. And then in 1949, the parish of Lehan was given to the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. An honor to be part of that. They started restoring the sanctuary and the damage that happened from the war, and it took until 1967 when Cardinal Wyszynski, who was then the primate of Poland, crowned the miraculous image of Our Lady of Lehan in the presence of 150,000 lay people. 150,000. Amazing. That's how strong their faith is in Poland. There are many bishops, hundreds of priests and religious that were all there. The number of pilgrims has been increasing ever since. This is our Marian shrine. I had the honor of going there. Now let's take a look at our next slide. This is Brother Mark. Have you ever seen a more incredible church? Father, that's disgusting. How dare a church look that ambiance and beautiful and that expensive? No, it was all from donations. Specifically given to build that church. And secondly, we are supposed to give God our best. Jesus and Judas is the one that said that money could have been given to the poor. Jesus is the one said, you'll always have the poor with us. You first give to God then we take care of the poor. We first give to God. So this is not sacrilege. This is the beauty, sacred beauty of God. And so thanks to these pilgrims, the generosity, many from the United States, many Polish, they built this shrine, Our Lady of Lehand. It was finished in the early 2000s and the the 2000th anniversary of the birth of our Lord, it was dedicated. So John Paul II consecrated this largest church in Poland, the largest church in Poland in 1999. Here's another one last picture. The shrine is modeled after St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. It's the second largest church in all of Europe. Look at the inside picture there. It's our last, last slide before we come to the video. It's the inside church. It's beautiful. So we Marian fathers, 
We're the shrine custodians, and we hope that this will be the permanent home of the image of Our Lady of Lehan, renowned for many graces. So let's finish with a quick video, then we'll begin with the devotion to First Saturday. So here's the video on Our Lady of Lehan. So isn't that an amazing house of worship for our Lord? If you ever get a chance to get to Poland, go to Our Lady of Lehan and say hi to the Marian Fathers. Well, God bless all of you. This wraps up our talk on the first Saturday uh, for the Marian apparitions. We will now, with the help of Brother Alex, Brother Ken, and Brother Mark, we're going to end this video. Brother Mark is going to stop this recording of the talk, and in a few minutes, we'll be back up to join us at 11.45 or a little after for the devotion of First Saturday. If you don't know what First Saturday is and what Our Lady asks us to do, that's okay. You can start with us today. We're going to walk you through exactly what to do as part of Our Lady's request to fulfill the First Saturday devotions. Very important. And I tell you what, it has to do with Russia and what's going on with Russia right now in the Ukraine. We need this prayer of the First Saturdays more than ever. So praise be to God that he sent you here to be with us. And you know what? Be with us in our Marian family. The last slide I wanted to show, if you're not a Marian helper already, please join us at micprayers.org. You can become a Marian helper. It doesn't cost anything. It takes but a moment. And there's a lot of graces by decree of the Holy See that you can get just like you were a Marian. And what a beautiful amount of grace you can get. So until we see you next Saturday, stay with us in a few minutes as we come back up for the first Saturday. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.